Hello, Redemption Church. Uh, Pastor Jason here to talk to you a little bit about the book of Habakkuk. Um, I guess even that probably is interesting as how you pronounce that uh, crazy name. Uh, but um, I'll probably be saying something like Habakkuk uh, the whole time. I, I searched uh, several books and none of them gave me that nice phonetic uh, pronunciation that it's supposed to be. So um, whether I'm right or not, that's what you're going to be stuck with with this one. All righty. So so as far as the name goes, that it's kind of part of it because we really don't know much about this guy, right? Uh, Habakkuk is a guy that's um, outside of this book, and I guess he's mentioned in an apocryphal book called Bell and the Dragon, uh, in which it, it basically refers to uh, Daniel's time in the, uh, in the lion's den, and supposedly Habakkuk gave him nourishment or something like that, gave him some food while he was in there, according to that um, that book. Like I said, that's an apocryphal book. We have no evidence that that ever uh, took place, but, uh, but that's the other place that Habakkuk is mentioned. Uh, the name Habakkuk means, uh, in notes here, basically uh, means a person that is either being embraced or one who embraces uh, someone else. It's basically two Hebrew words put together to bring that about. And outside of that name, uh, we don't know much about this guy. Uh, as far as just context and stuff with him, uh, the writing itself, the book, uh, seems to have been written somewhere in the, you know, 605 to 590s, you know, kind of time frame. It seems to be post Josiah's um, time as king, uh, but before the fall uh, of Judah. So, so with this, we see in this book the kind of the rising up of the power of the Chaldeans, that Babylonian empire. And so, so with that, it kind of gives us an idea that we're kind of toward the end of the Assyrian empire and kind of looking at uh, the beginning of the Babylonian empire. So, again, gives us a little idea of what's going on, plus uh, just the state of the people of Israel. Uh, that's one of, you know, Habakkuk's chief complaints is how uh, violent and just and downright just terrible the people of Israel, uh, people of Judah, I guess it would be for him, uh, are, and and so with that that idea that violence and all that stuff, uh, that seems to be also kind of a post Josiah time frame because during Josiah's time there was this great revival, the people were were turning back to God and definitely were at least uh, serving God at least in, uh, you know, it's maybe, maybe not their hearts were, but at least uh, physically they, they were doing what the king asked and they were, they were serving, uh, God. Uh, but at this time with, uh, Habakkuk, that is not the case. And so if we get kind of into the flow of the book, uh, we see that <clears throat> it starts off, you know, outside of that introductory first vo uh, verse, but that it's basically a series of, at the beginning, a series of complaints and answers, right? Prayers and answers that we see with Habakkuk and and with uh, and with God. Okay, and so so Habakkuk, his first complaint is basically about the people of Judah, right? They, these folks are are really messed up. God, how long are you going to let this happen, right? They are violent. They are unjust. They are just you know all kinds of things going on. If we look in other historical books, we see that idolatry is rampant and all those things. So there's a lot of things happening uh, that um, Habakkuk is, is very, um, you know, very distraught about. He's very upset about. And so he's asking, you know, maybe what a lot of us are asking in our world right now, God, how long? How long are you going to let this go on? How long is, are things going to keep going like this? Well, uh, God answers. And, and so with God's answer, he Basically, he says, uh, well, I'm preparing a people. He's preparing the Chaldeans. That's basically the Babylonian Empire. Preparing them to come into Judah at some point in the future and to, uh, to inflict his punishment, to inflict his wrath, and to punish the nation uh, for their, uh, their evil uh, idolatry and uh, violence and injustice and all that kind of stuff. Well, uh, you know, Habakkuk got his answer, but he's not really happy with that answer. Habakkuk has heard of these uh, Babylonians, and he he recognizes that they are 
if he could be so proud to say, <laughs> worse than the Jew, uh, than the people of Israel, worse than the people of Judah are. And so, yes, he wants them punished. He wants Judah punished, but does it have to be the Chaldeans? I mean, he's really kind of, eh, uh, God, I don't know uh, about that. You're too, he uses the statement basically saying, uh, you know, are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them as judgment. O Lord, O Rock, you have established them for a, for a proof, right? He's agreeing, you know, that's what you've done. Uh, but you are pure eyes and to see evil and cannot look at wrong. Why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up? And so uh, swallows up the man more righteous than he. So, yeah, I wanted you to punish Judah, but this isn't what I had in mind. Uh, these Babylonians are, are bad news. And um, how, God, you're too pure for this. How can you be bringing on this, uh, this, evil, uh, this evil people, right, to do your work? Well, and so, so with that, uh, again, that's uh, Jeremiah's, or uh, Jeremiah, Habakkuk's second complaint, uh, wanting to know why this, God, why would you do this? And so Habakkuk then kind of takes a, whether he goes really up onto a mountain or whether it's kind of a uh, virtual kind of in his mind, kind of imagining uh, going up to kind of a watchtower, but he's just kind of waiting. Uh, he's going to wait uh, for God's second answer here. And God does, again, answer. And this, uh, one of the more, f uh, I guess, famous verses of this book is part of this answer. Habakkuk 2.4, Behold, his soul is puffed up, but it's not upright within him but the righteous shall live by his faith. And if that sounds familiar to you, it should, because there are three times in the New Testament where that verse is, is quoted. And so we'll get into that here a little bit later. But, but this answer kind of comes through, God saying, you have a point, uh, Habakkuk, uh, but I'm still going to do this. But, but also the Chaldeans are going to meet their punishment as well. God is sovereign. God is in control. He can take... Um, you know, uh, one nation to use against another nation, regardless of how good or bad uh, that nation is. And so God has this plan. He's going to work it out. Uh, but he goes on a little further in chapter two to now say what's going to happen to the Chaldeans. Uh, you're right. They are an evil people, Habakkuk, and they too will suffer punishment. They too will be uh, brought low. But, but still, they can be the instrument that God uses uh, to bring about the punishment of Judah. And then, uh, so after he gets through uh, that, that uh, long section in chapter 2 of the woe to the Chaldeans, then we get into a really kind of an interesting chapter. Chapter 3 is is another prayer, but this one's not a complaint. Uh, this one isn't, uh, this one isn't Habakkuk being upset or sad or, or uh, angry about things. It's, it's his recognition of that sovereignty of God, of that power of, uh, of God. And so, uh, so through this, it's, this prayer, it's kind of a psalm in a sense, and even has psalm like terms like Selah and things like that within it, and even has uh, the type of instruments that they should, should, you know, use to, to do this, uh, this chapter. And so, so it's basically a psalm to God in which he just talks about how great God is, how powerful God is. Uh, there was an old worship song uh, by Rich Mullins called Awesome God. And I remember looking up his, you know, kind of some of the verses he would have posted in his little, yes, cassette tape thing about um, where his inspiration came for the song. And it was this, this chapter was one of the things that inspired him to really think of God as an awesome and powerful God. And this chapter does that. And so, so Habakkuk, kind of brings this uh, to a close. And what's interesting, at the very end, um, he, you know, basically says these statements from chapter se uh, verses 17 through 19. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive uh, fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. I mean, basically verse 17, if all this stuff goes wrong, if everything goes wrong, Verse 18, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. So as we reach the end of this book, very short book, right? It's a uh, three-chapter minor prophet book. 
But as we reach the end of that book, uh, what we see is that the situation that Habakkuk is in, right? The nation of Judah is still violent, is still unjust, is still deserving of punishment. That's still the case. The Chaldeans are still the people that God is going to use to bring that punishment. So nothing of that has changed. But what has changed is Habakkuk. Habakkuk has changed. He is now recognizing the power and sovereignty of God. He is now okay with that. He is he is willing to rejoice in God, to, to wait on his uh, plan and his um just what God is going to do, he's willing to wait on that. And so he can rejoice in the Lord, even though all this bad stuff's going to happen. And so with this, one of the things we're right we're doing with going through these chapter these books of the Old Testament is to see Christ in these books and how it kind of refers to to him. And what we see is, well, a couple of things. First, I do want to kind of hit on uh, back at chapter two, verse four, but the righteous shall live by faith. That gets quoted, um, like I said, three times in the New Testament. Romans 1.17, which is at the heart of, you know, uh, basically, let me uh, flip to it real quick. So we go Romans uh, 1.17. you got to start with 16, right? For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, here's our verse, the righteous shall live by faith. So this particular usage of that uh, thing, I was reading in a, in a commentary that, um, you know, the idea of what Paul means by faith and saving faith of all that wouldn't necessarily have been what Habakkuk had in mind. Uh, but Paul is able to take that as a foundation and then kind of build on that now that Christ has died and we've got that death of Christ to, to, to work with as well. And so this uh, particular passage in Romans, I mean, Paul's getting into how we're saved, right? This is how uh, a man uh, or a woman becomes a Christian, how they become a child of God is, is through faith. And, and so any righteousness we have is going to be by faith. And so, so that first idea of salvation is there. And then in, in Galatians uh, is when the next one comes through. And there he's talking about and comparing the Galatians are having a problem with they were wanting to follow the law and not just, again, not just uh, trust in the grace of God uh, for salvation. And so he really wants to bring home the point that that you are justified not by your works, but by faith. And again, he quotes this verse. So that's in Galatians 3.11. And so there we're looking at how we're justified in God's sight. It's not, it's not by the works we do. It's by the, the faith that we have, uh, thanks to the grace of God. And then uh, the final uh, place where it's quoted is in Hebrews 10.38. And so Paul uses it a couple times. Uh, the author of Hebrews, whoever that was, uses it as well. And in 10.38, he's looking more at the perseverance uh, of the saints. And he actually pretty much quotes... Um, uh, uh, verses 3 and 4 from Habakkuk. Uh, and he is getting at, basically he's talking to the people. Uh, let's go ahead and flip to Hebrews. Um, while we're doing this right. So Hebrews 10, uh, 38. Well, we'll go a little earlier in 37 here. For yet a little while, and the coming one... Uh, will come and will not delay. That's a reference to uh, Habakkuk uh, 2, 3. But my righteous one shall live by faith. There's 2, 4. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. In verse 39, but we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and, and preserve their souls. So in this passage, we're getting more into that perseverance of the saints that, uh, that once we are a child of God, once we have been saved, that, that now... That is a forever thing. If you continue to have faith, uh, then God will continue to hold on to you, right? He He is by you, uh, by His grace. We've been saved by uh, by faith. All of that coming together, and it's by His grace that we stay saved. And and so uh, so that extra step, that perseverance. So we get kind of a little nuance of of, the, of faith uh, through each one of those uh, verses. Take it that extra step. Okay, so that's saving faith, and that's, you know, in Christ that that happens. 
And then the other thing I want to just kind of point out is what Habakkuk is doing uh, in this book is he's praying for his people. He's an intercessor, right? His, he's interceding for the people of Israel. Well, people of Judah, as he keeps saying Israel, but the people of Judah, right? Because that's all that's left at this point are the people of Judah. And he is interceding for these folks and he wants them to be right with God. He wants God to, it's, yes, he wants them to punish, but really I think he wants God to correct them and bring them back to himself. And that's what he's praying for. And God will do it, but it's going to take a while. He's got some other things he's got to, to, to complete before that can happen. And so Habakkuk being that intercessor for the people of God, that is kind of the way Jesus is now uh, for us, right? When, when Jesus came to earth, he came to earth to, to live that perfect life, to, to follow the law of God so that he could then die that perfect uh, sacrifice for us so that we could then, uh, when we place our faith in him, we can be saved. And, but once that death happened, right, Christ is alive again. He has been resurrected, but he, and he still has a role that he plays. Okay. And we see a picture of that in, in John 17, before he leaves, before he's crucified, he prays that long, uh, high priestly prayer in which he intercedes for all the people of God, from his disciples to really us, right, uh, in, in our world today. And so he prays for those people, people and he is interceding for them. And then as we look at other places in uh, the New Testament, again, uh, if we go to Hebrews uh, chapter 7, verse 25, uh, this one's uh, pretty cool in that it tells us that that is what, what he lives to do right now is to intercede for us. So... Uh, 725, um, consequently, is that he is able to save to the uttermost. He's, uh, they've been talking about Melchizedek, and Jesus compared to Melchizedek. It's a whole other study in and of itself. Um, but Jesus has become a permanent priest for us, okay? And the priest's role is to take, basically, uh, to, to take uh, the complaints and the, and, and, the th and the needs of the people to God, okay? And so... Uh, Jesus is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Think about that. He right now always lives. That's his role that he does is he is constantly praying for us. He is constantly going to the Father saying, that sin, I died for that sin. Um, you know, as Satan accuses us, as Satan uh, goes to God and says, well, look at that, look at that. Uh, Jesus say, nope, I've got that. And we, and we get a little more of this in 1 John uh, chapter 2, verse 1. Um, My little children, I'm writing these things to, to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So our advocate, our lawyer, our again, our intercessor is, is Christ. And he does that for us so that um, because we still sin, we still fail, uh, but God is able to uh, hear the prayers of Christ and um, and therefore, I mean, we're forgiven, uh, but Jesus constantly praying for us, helping us through um, all the different things that we encounter and all the different sins that we commit. And so Habakkuk was kind of an earlier version of that where, and really a lot of the prophets fall into that category of where uh, they are praying for the people there, weeping before God, wanting him to to save uh, the people and to change them and Habakkuk is just another example of that intercessory person um, and and Jesus fulfills that in, it, in its perfection as he always lives to do that for us now right he doesn't take a day off he doesn't take a moment off he is constantly praying for us and uh, and that is awesome <laughs> to think about because I know I need it uh, in all kinds of ways and I'm sure you feel that way too uh, and Jesus is there for us. Okay, so that's uh, Habakkuk. And um, so, uh, again, be thankful that Christ is constantly praying for us. Be thankful that as bad as the world is around us, that uh, God still has a plan. He's still in control. He's still sovereign. And Jesus is still uh, saving people. And uh, so let us rest in him uh, through, uh, through the rest of our lives and, and each day. May we trust and rest in him.